Okay, so uh, thank you so much for um, uh, for the invitation. So um, what I'm interested in uh, um, in this paper is uh, um, uh, to talk about the possible channel through which uh, monetary policy, or at least a certain type of uh, monetary intervention, can affect the financial sector and uh, um, the real uh, the real sector of the economy. Now, uh, if um, uh, we uh, think uh, about the typical uh, channels uh, through which uh, uh, monetary policy can affect the, uh, the real sector of the, the macroeconomy in general. Uh, here I listed the three, um, uh, three possible channels. So one is, uh, for instance, uh, what I call the cost channel. Uh, this works uh, through the interest rates. For instance, if you have uh, um, uh, firms that need to fund working capital, higher interest rate translates higher cost. Uh, or uh, finance investment, of course, a high interest rate translated in higher cost. Um, uh, somewhat uh, related is the credit channel. In some sense, uh, it's very similar, but it works not so much uh, uh, through the cost of funding uh, economic activity or, uh, or investment, but it works uh, in terms of uh, allowing, in some sense, uh, banks to uh, expand their credit. Okay? So in some sense, it's like relaxing the borrowing, um, borrowing constraint. And then there is uh, the channel that works through the uh, aggregate demand, this is more typical of the uh, new Keynesian, um, uh, Keynesian uh, uh, framework. But in all uh, um, those channels, uh, the idea is that low interest rates uh, have a, a positive effect on uh, the, real sector, the real sector of the economy. So you reduce the interest rate, you have uh, an expansionary, uh, expansionary effect. What I would like to do today uh, is uh, to emphasize uh, also another uh, possible channel that, uh, um, uh, uh, that uh, I believe uh, has received a little bit less, uh, less attention. Or uh, more precisely, um, uh, is very common in uh, discussion. So it's uh, something that uh, um, perhaps has been discussed a lot, but there is a little bit less formalization. Okay? And uh, what I would like to emphasize in particular is that uh, um, uh, uh, low interest rates also implies uh, uh, low savings. And in particular, I would like to emphasize that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, low interest rates also uh, reduce the incentive to hold certain, particular, certain assets, in particular liquid assets. Okay? Now, uh, uh, the, the point that today I would like, uh, would like to make is that uh, when uh, uh, there is a less, less incentive to hold those uh, liquid assets and to the extent that uh, those who hold those liquid assets uh, make decisions, uh, production decisions uh, and investment decisions, actually this might have a negative effect on, uh, might have a negative macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic effect. They also, the uh, second uh, channel that, uh, um, the second effect of low interest rate that today I would like to emphasize is also that low interest rates also means that the uh, um, uh, uh, means that the cost of funding is lower, so in in, in, in typically this is considered to be positive, uh, but it's also increases incentive to leverage. Okay, so uh, low interest rate might also increase uh, uh, financial uh, uh, instability through higher, uh, higher leverages and uh, through financial instability also macroeconomic uh, instability. Okay, so basically the, uh, what uh, the paper that I'm presenting today is to emphasize this uh, pos possible negative effect both in terms of uh, level Okay, uh, uh, reduce economic activities, but also in terms of uh, increasing uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, instability. Okay. And especially, I will emphasize that uh, this uh, uh, instability coming th uh, through higher leverage could uh, uh, um, work through the financial intermediation uh, sector. Okay. Um, uh, before continuing, perhaps I should remark that uh, uh, here the goal is not to say that uh, the traditional typical channels are not important, uh, and so we should uh, uh, just uh, change our view of the economy. It's just that uh, to expand a little bit our uh, consideration of what could be the consequences of uh, 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 low, uh, uh, low interest rates. Okay. And uh, I would like to uh, illustrate that with uh, a, a, a model that has uh, some features. 
Okay, and uh, the best uh, way to uh, uh, introduce the model with a schematic, uh, a schematic view. So this will be a model where uh, financial intermediation uh, play, uh, um, play a role. Okay, so once uh, uh, you uh, want to talk about financial intermediation, of course you need uh, two sectors, that, uh, one sector that borrows and one sector that uh, lends, and then in between there will be some operator that we call banks uh, or more generally financial, uh, financial um, uh, uh, intermediaries. Now in the model, who are the net savers uh, uh, and who are the net borrowers? Okay, and uh, uh, that's now that in the model I'm going to present the net uh, uh, net savers or, or, or lender turns out to be the entrepreneurs, the producers. Okay. So those are uh, basically are the firms. Okay. Uh, while the borrowers turns out to be the households. Okay. Now this uh, uh, raises some 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 concern because uh, this, in some sense, is like uh, the opposite of the typical models that uh, we are used to work. Right. So we think uh, about the firms uh, in needs of funds, so they borrow. Who provides those funds are the uh, uh, are the household. So here, what I'm doing, I'm doing exactly the opposite. I'm going the reverse, reverse uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, this mechanism. And you might say, uh, why do you do that? And uh, uh, this is something that uh, I've been thinking now for a while. And uh, what brought me uh, to uh, consider a framework like that uh, comes from uh, uh, the, following, uh, the following graph. This uh, uh, graph uh, um, plots uh, the um, net financial assets okay, uh, held by uh, the business sector for the United States. Okay. So basically, this is the difference between financial assets minus uh, uh, financial liabilities. Minus liabilities. Okay, now uh, it's divided in two sectors. There is the corporate business sector, the non-corporate business sector, and uh, as you see, for the business, the, for the uh, uh, corporate sector, effectively they were net borrowers, but more recently they uh, happens to be net lenders. Uh, does now to be. This is not something new. Uh, this has been emphasized by many uh, uh, by um, by many people, and fundamentally that was a criticism. <laughs> Okay, to those models where the channel of transmission works through the financing to the business sector. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the criticism was, uh, how can you say that uh, uh, financial friction are so important when you look at the corporations, they have so much cash? Okay, when we talk about cash, we don't think uh, uh, really the, 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 the cash in strict sense. We think about financial, uh, financial, uh, financial assets. Okay? So what uh, I would like to do here is uh, to present the framework where it captures to some extent uh, that kind of pattern. That kind of pattern. But nevertheless, uh, I would like to show that the financial friction are still important uh, and they do some, in, to some extent are, uh, are as important as uh, uh, in the framework in which uh, uh, firms are uh, 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 borrowing constraints. Of course, uh, the, this is an aggregate measure. <laughs> you may say, yes, it's true, but on net, uh, on net uh, uh, the corporate sector is uh, uh, lending on net. But there is a lot of heterogeneity, so uh, there are a lot of firms that are still are financially constrained. That is true, definitely, but I would, say, I would say that there is also a big chunk of the business sector that in principle is not that, that they don't reflect that situation in which they would like to hire more workers, they would like to borrow more, but they are scarce of funds of doing that. If they want to do now, they have the resources to do that, but for some, for some reason they don't. Okay. Okay, so uh, that uh, is the, basically the, the uh, framework that uh, um, uh, I would like to, um, uh, to present. And now I'm going to describe in details how this framework uh, works. Okay, and uh, I will start, um, sorry, I will start with, uh, uh, um, oops, let me find the point. Okay, here, I'm, I, I'm, I start uh, um, presenting this, uh, this sector. I then uh, present this, and finally introduce inter uh, the financial intermediation sector. And then uh, there will be, of course, I'm talking about monetary policy, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, somehow the monetary, of monetary fiscal authority has to enter into the model, and the way he enters is through affecting the, uh, dire and oper basically operate directly through, fin uh, through financial intermediaries, through banks. Okay. okay. 
So how does it work? Uh, this is how I model, uh, I model the, the production sector. It's a, it's a sector in which there are producers, those are, I call them entrepreneurs, okay? And what do, the, do, the, what do the entrepreneurs do? They maximize their lifetime utility, which is basically a lifetime utility in uh, consumption. But what is important is that uh, consumption of dividends, if you, uh, if you want. But what is important is that uh, those the consumption of dividends uh, um, enter in their objective in a concave way. So basically they are risk averse. So risk aversion plays an important, an important role. What do they do? They produce. How do they, do they, uh, how do they produce? With a very simple production function, which is linear in only one input of production. I don't have capital, okay? but it's not really essential. It's uh, purely to make the model as simple as possible. So there is only one input of production, which H is labor. But what is actually produced depends also on the realization of this Z. Z is an idiosyncratic shock. Okay, it's not an aggregate shock, it's an idiosyncratic. And here is the key assumption. The choice of the input of production has to be made, has to be made before the realization of the shock. So I choose how much to produce, how many workers to hire. After that, I see how productive, or if you don't want to think about productivity, how worth is the production of those workers. So why I'm doing that? Because that introduces a risk. And uh, since they are, the, 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 those agents are risk averse, they don't like the risk. So it becomes important what they can do to ensure that risk. Okay, and obviously, if we had a, a, a framework with complete market, that wouldn't matter. <laughs> okay, so of course, I'm making very strong assumption about market incompleteness, and the assumption that I'm going to make is that uh, the only thing that they can hold to ensure those risks for consumption uh, for consumption smoothing, basically, are bonds. Uh, it's like a, a non-contingent asset that pay an interest rate. What are those uh, assets? Turns out to be in this model uh, liability issues by banks. Okay, so banks issue liabilities like uh, uh, they collect the deposits. Okay, and those uh, uh, those entrepreneurs they deposit they make they, they deposit their savings in the banks, in the bank, and the bank pro provide an interest rate. Okay, now that's now that because of linear technology and log utility, the, uh, the decision, uh, the optimal decision of those entrepreneurs uh, uh, are very uh, are very simple. Uh, um, essentially, uh, we know that uh, savings are, are a, a fraction of their their net worth. But here in this framework, what is really important is this: is the demand of labor. So the demand of labor basically depends. Oh, I, I forget, I forgot to mention this. This, this financial non-contingent asset that pay in interest uh, uh, are denoted by B. Okay, so B represents effectively the financial wealth of those uh, firms, if you if you want to, uh, to call firms or entrepreneurs. Okay, so the demand of labor depends linearly and positively, of course, on their financial wealth. So the, uh, the idea is that uh, if uh, I have more wealth, I hire more, wor more workers. So I have a larger scale, uh, a scale of production. Obviously, the, 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 proportion, the proportional factor depends on the wage. Obviously, if the wage is higher, higher I want to hire less workers. Okay. So this is really the important, the important feature uh, uh, of the model. And, uh, Essentially, that allows me to aggregate all those entrepreneurs, even though they face a lot of risk and there is a lot of heterogeneity. It doesn't matter the distribution, and we can aggregate, we can derive this demand of labor, which depends on the financial wealth of the entrepreneur. And what I plot here is the demand of labor as a function of wage. Okay? So, uh, that essentially is the production sector. Okay. So now, uh, to uh, close uh, the real sector of the economy, I need the, deep, the supply of labor. So I'm moving to the next sector, which is, which is the household sector. Okay. So here, I also try to make things as simple as possible. And um, here is another assumption that might raise a lot of uh, concerns. Uh, I'm actually assuming that, that those workers uh, don't care about the risk. Okay, seems strange, right? Because we think entrepreneurs are risk lovers, right? But I can assure you that that is not really the feature that is important. The feature that is important is not that entrepreneurs are more risk averse than workers, is that entrepreneurs face more risk than workers. That is really the key, the key assumption. Why is that? Because uh, ultimately, those entrepreneurs, they want to hold those assets for precautionary reasons. 
okay, to ensure their production risk. So they are willing to hold those assets even though the interest rate is lower than the intertemporal discount rate. Okay? But workers are risk neutral. So if the interest rate is lower than the intertemporal discount rate, they don't want to lend, they want to borrow. Okay, so this is why in this model we end up having that the flow of funds goes from the worker, the household sector, to go to, to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, production, uh, the production sector. And the workers uh, uh, borrow f to do what? To finance basically a non-reproducible uh, uh, asset that I call houses. Okay, so it's like a sort of a mortgages if you, um, uh, um, uh, if you want. And uh, they don't like to work. As uh, you can see from this, uh, uh, this utility, so that allows me to derive the supply of labor, essentially, which uh, is uh, simply a function of the, uh, of the wage. Okay. So that uh, derived the, the supply of labor. So now I can put together <laughs> demand and supply, right? The demand that comes from entrepreneurs negatively related to wages. The supply is positively related to wages. So I first look at uh, an equilibrium in which uh, I abstract from, from, from um, uh, banks, from inter, uh, financial, uh, financial intermediary. So the equilibrium can be characterized simply as an intersection of demand of labor from entrepreneurs and the supply from workers. Now here what is really key, which is, uh, allows us to understand what is coming next, is really the demand of labor. Depends on the financial assets of the entrepreneurs. Okay. So what happens when those, uh, that financial wealth uh, drops? So suppose that uh, the, the, the B drops for some reason, okay. essentially demand of labor drops, and uh, obviously there will be a recession. Okay. Now, that's now that uh, a monetary intervention has uh, that kind of uh, effect. <laughs> Okay, so the monetary intervention, the ones that I'm going to consider, I'm going to introduce, essentially cried out the financial asset holdings of these entrepreneurs. And the intuition is very simple. It reduces the interest rate. So those entrepreneurs don't want to hold this, 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 so, so much financial wealth. Because the interest rate is low. It's very costly in terms of opportunity cost to, uh, to hold those, uh, those uh, financial assets. Second mechanism, and this is the volatility, is that... Uh, the other reason this oops the other reason those financial assets might drop is because uh, what are those financial assets are liabilities issued by banks but what happens if banks default <laughs> part of that wealth will be lost right they don't, don't don't repay those liabilities so there will be a drop in financial wealth of the entrepreneur simply because uh, there, there, there was, a, let's call it, a crisis or some uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, banking crisis, basically. Okay. So that is the key to understand, uh, understand, uh, understand, uh, understand the model. Okay. So uh, now let me int uh, finally introduce the financial intermediary. Again, I do in a very... Uh, in a very uh, uh, simple, uh, simple, uh, simple way, um, um, many stylized, uh, stylized effect, uh, stylized uh, assumption. What are banks? Banks are firms, profit maximizing. Okay. Some, uh, some assumption: who all the banks, uh, uh, which is actually within the framework is important, are the households. Okay, so households are shareholders of banks. What do banks uh, uh, do? Well, they, um, they uh, uh, issue liabilities, okay? And uh, uh, they use the liability in conjunction with their net worth, with their equity, to make uh, investment, so loans. Okay, who buy those uh, li uh, uh, liabilities? In these frameworks, because now in general, in, in equilibrium, will be the entrepreneurs. Okay. Who will receive the loans in equilibrium will be the households. Okay. And uh, they make a, uh, a uh, um, uh, um, uh, financial structure uh, decision. So they choose uh, what should be the, le the leverage and so, and so forth. Okay. Now, the key uh, assumption here to generate uh, some, uh, some uh, 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 fluctuation is that uh, once the banks have raised their liabilities, okay, they could default. 
So what does it mean default? They pay less than they promised. Okay. And what determines whether they default or not is uh, what is the liquidation value of their, their investment. Okay. So here what I'm assuming is that uh, the liquidation value of those investment okay, is, uh, a, 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 is given by the product of the, in, the original investment times this variable. And I make it this variable stochastic. So good times is when uh, if a bank is going to default, uh, creditors can sell their asset and they resell in the market and they can get a big value from that. So it will be the case in which uh, one uh, um, I liquidate, uh, uh, um, oops, where is it? Okay, I liquidate I and I get back the full amount. So it's when Xi is equal to one. Okay, so there are no losses. But there are some other times where if the, the I liquidate the assets, the investment of the banks and uh, I sell in the market, I don't get back 100%. Okay, I get less. Okay, so, when do banks default is when, of course, the liquidation value is low. Okay? So uh, that is the way it, the, uh, the, uh, it, works, um, <clears throat> it works in the model. In some sense, it's like, uh, it's like uh, uh, this applies also uh, for the case of uh, a homeowner who funded the, the investment through a mortgage. The value of the house is lower than the liquidation value of the house is lower. So uh, uh, there is an incentive basically to renegotiate the loan. And here, renegotiation of the loans means reducing the loan. Okay? So whoever funded that, uh, that, uh, that uh, borrower, he will receive less. There will be basically a capital loss. This is the way uh, uh, it works. Then the last assumption is that uh, to make sure that the, the um, capital structure is an interior solution so that you don't want to finance um, uh, the investment 100%, you just assume that there is this uh, uh, convex cost uh, which in increases in, uh, in leverage. Okay? Now, this, uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, basic framework comes from, an, uh, from uh, some other work that uh, I did. And uh, in that other work, actually, I interpreted, I interpreted this XI as a, a, actually a market price, market price that can uh, fluctuate uh, um, uh, um, uh, through self-fulfilling uh, expectation, actually. But in this paper, I'm just assuming that is ex an exogenous variable. Sometimes the liquidation value is high, sometimes it's low. Okay, that is basically the model. So to give you, uh, to give you a, 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 some more intuition, so thinking that, uh, that way, so I are the investment that the bank make. So those, are, again, are loans to, um, to households, okay? Now, the uh, liquidation value of those uh, uh, investments could be i if uh, psi is equal to 1, or it could be psi lower bar. Okay? So in other words, the liquidation value could be either this or this. And there is, uh, it could switch with some probability okay, between the two. Now, if the liabilities of the bank okay, is below this value, obviously never default. <laughs> Right, because uh, the liquidation value is always bigger than the liability. Okay. But if uh, we are in this situation, then uh, if uh, uh, the uh, liquidation value drops from this to this, then of course uh, the bank might uh, have uh, an incentive to uh, uh, renege, or if you want, is unable to repay. Okay. What does it mean if uh, the liquidation value is this and the liability are that? It means that essentially the bank renegotiate back the liability to this point. Okay? Now, take also that into account that uh, suppose that the liability actually are farther to the right. With the low realization of the shock, the renegotiation is bigger. Okay? So you get a bigger discount. Okay? That's now that uh, the monetary policy intervention that reduces the interest rate has the effect of moving this to the right. So in other words, as the effect of increasing the leverage of banks. Why? Because uh, it reduces the interest rate, so the cost of funding those investments for the bank goes down, so the incentive to leverage increases. So that is one key to understand the, uh, the, uh, the higher volatility.
So now let me introduce monetary fiscal, um, fiscal authority. Um, uh, this uh, um, uh, mon for, uh, uh, um, might be a little bit disappointing for those uh, working in monetary, uh, uh, monetary economics because effectively I don't have a, 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 a fiat money here. So the way I design a monetary policy intervention is basically uh, as follows. <clears throat> it's basically is, uh, in the form of asset pa purchases. So what the monetary, I call fiscal authority, does, it goes uh, to the bank and buys, uh, and buys uh, the uh, uh, liabilities of, ba uh, of banks. Okay? So uh, typically this happens with the fiat money, right? So you inject liquidity. <laughs> Okay. Here I make the, uh, the, 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 because I said I abstract from fiat money, essentially those purchases are back, backed by uh, taxes, effectively. But, <clears throat> Um, so the, the, this is essentially the, uh, the budget constraint. So here M represents how much of the liabilities that banks have issued are really held by this uh, monetary uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal authority. Okay. So once you have that, we can look at the equilibrium for the bank liability. Okay? So banks issue this amount of liabilities. Who buy those liabilities? In part will be the entrepreneurs. In part will be the monetary authority. Okay? So effectively when M increases, so this will be, it, it, it can be interpreted as asset purchases. Okay. Effectively, there is in, this increase in the demand of these bank liabilities. So obviously, the interest rate drops, <laughs> right? But you can see that uh, to the extent that L does increase much, uh, you can see that if M increases, B has to go down, right? So it's a, it's a little bit like a crowding out. Obviously, this uh, intervention will also generate a, an increase in loans. Okay, so households now, they get more loans, obviously, so there is a, a credit expansion. And in fact, we'll have also a positive impact on prices of houses. Okay? But for ultimately for production, it's B that matters. Okay? It's how much liquidity really the, pro, pro, the, 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 the production sector really, uh, really holds. Okay? So that is the basically is the, uh, is the uh, framework that uh, I'm, uh, I'm using. So now I would like to show uh, some simulations. Um, uh, the, uh, so this is what I do in uh, the simulation. I um, uh, assume I start with the, uh, the uh, asset held by the monetary fiscal authority, so uh, will be zero to start with. Okay, it doesn't really matter. I could start with a positive. Uh, positive. So here what I'm, I would like to see what happens if that uh, asset purchases from the uh, monetary authority, fiscal monetary authority, increases. So I want, this is the, the goal of this exercise. So the fact that I start from M0 doesn't, that doesn't really matter. What is matter is the increase. So then I uh, assume that uh, the purchases, so M, uh, becomes positive, and the increase in M is about 10% the uh, 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 initial value of bank liabilities. Okay. okay, what is the shock in this uh, aggregate shock in this economy? There is the idiosyncratic shock at the firm level, but that uh, cancels out in the, in the, for the uh, production sector as a whole. Um, uh, the only purpose of that shock is to generate this uh, precautionary uh, demand for liquid, uh, liquid funds. <clears throat> the only shock is this uh, fluctuation in this uh, uh, liquidation value of uh, bank liability. Okay, so that is the, only, uh, 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 is the only shock, which effectively what it does, it redistributes wealth within the, uh, within the economy. Okay. So I simulated the economy in response to a random sequence of these, 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 these shocks. Those are very rare shocks, uh, happens with a 4% four, uh, 4 probability every year. Okay, so it's a very low uh, probability uh, because I interpret that as a bank crisis that of course is not very frequent. Okay. So what I do, I draw the sequence of, of Xi, okay. I simulate the model, but of course any time I draw a sequence of size, I get a different uh, pattern, right, for the economy, right? So uh, what uh, I do, I repeat the simulation many, many times. In particular, I repeat the simulation 1,000 times, 
Okay, and you will see why uh, that, that is important. Okay. So uh, here is, the, um, is basically the, uh, the results of the simulation. So the first is uh, what are the, the asset purchases? So how much of the bank liabilities are held by the monetary fiscal authority? Okay. So it was zero, but at this point, here is uh, basically a period one in, uh, in the, uh, um, uh, based on the labeling of, uh, I used. So there will be this increased okay, in uh, uh, asset holdings. So then uh, I sh I, in the uh, following graphs, I show what happens to different variables in the, um, in, uh, uh, in the model. Now you notice that there are three lines. So first, uh, I want to focus on the blue line, just focus on the blue, uh, the blue line. What is the blue line? Remember, I said that uh, I'm going to repeat this simulation 1,000 times, right? First simulation, second simulation, and so on. So I just take uh, the average. Actu this is actually quarter by quarter, quarter by quarter of this, uh, this 1,000 simulation. And effectively, what you see is that uh, with this uh, intervention, you see that on average the, uh, the borrowing rate goes, uh, goes down. So the borrowing rate for the bank, so this will be the interest rate on liabilities of the bank. But also the lending rate is going down. Okay, so also the loans, so both uh, interest rates are, uh, are, uh, are going down. But here what happens to the entrepreneur wealth, okay? Now the interest rate, this is the interest that uh, entrepreneurs are going to, uh, to, uh, to earn now on these uh, financial assets. And obviously, because the interest rate is lower, they don't have so much incentive to, 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 uh, to, uh, to save to all those assets. So you see that these assets are going down. Uh, but of course, uh, the overall bank liability is going up, so there is more liquidity in the bank <laughs> now. Okay. Uh, there is an expansion of the financial, uh, of the financial uh, sector, so there, is, there are more bank loans. But here is the issue, is that the bank leverage also increases. <laughs> okay. So in other words, now the spread, even though both interest rates are dropping, but the spread becomes bigger. <laughs> Okay, so there is much more incentive to, uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to leverage. Then uh, the price of this asset, the reproducible asset that household hold will increase. Okay. Why? Because now as in households, I can borrow a low interest rate. So obviously, if I can finance my house at the lower interest rate, the house is worth more. That essentially is the, is the idea. And finally, the macroeconomy. Macroeconomy yeah, production is purely labor, <laughs> depends. You see that labor is going down because effectively reflect the decline in the liquidity assets of the, uh, of the entrepreneurs. So now let, let me uh, discuss uh, the two red lines. What are the two red lines? The two red lines are the, uh, the uh, percentile, uh, phi and 95 percentiles of these 1,000 simulations. So it's effectively a measure of how volatile is the economy. So as this, uh, these percentiles becomes wider and wider and wider, essentially you have more potential volatility. Okay? And you can see that uh, essentially uh, that, uh, that range tends to spread out. Okay? So what is the intuition? Again, is the fact that now uh, uh, banks are more leveraged, because banks are more leveraged, when there is uh, that negative shock, it's true happens uh, very seldom with a very low probability, it, it, it is true. But when it happens, because banks are, uh, are much more leveraged, what they do, they, uh, they renegotiate more <laughs> the liabilities. So the, 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 the uh, entrepreneurial sector realizes bigger, stronger uh, uh, capital losses essentially. So their wealth drops more. And so they react more by reducing more the demand of labor. So that is the, is the, uh, is the, um, is the simulation. I have uh, just one minute, so uh, I can uh, also uh, discuss uh, another type of simulation that I did. And then I'm, I, I close down. Um, so here, the, the way I conducted the simulation, I randomly draw this shock. And then I input the shock into the model and see what, are the, 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 what is the pattern of all uh, various uh, variables. Now instead I do uh, a, 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 
a simpler simulation. I'm going to assume that uh, this uh, shock is always good. So if you liquidate the asset of the bank, it's always a uh, one. But then all of a sudden it drops and then it goes back. Okay, so let's see what happens to the model under two assumptions about monetary policy. <laughs> One assumption is that the monetary policy doesn't do anything. And the other, instead, it reacts by reducing the interest rate, so by purchasing bank liability. It does that for four quarters. Actually, eight quarters, sorry. Eight quarters. So this is what happens. So the, in, the, in the blue, the uh, authority, uh, uh, so here's when the shock arises, okay? It's only once, okay? Then it goes back, okay? The first doesn't do anything in the blue, but in the red, he purchases uh, the uh, bank uh, liability for eight quarters and then he uh, resell. So effectively, what he does, uh, he makes the, 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 the response of the economy uh, uh, larger. It's like a, it's that kind of intervention amplifies <laughs> The, the impact of, uh, of the shock. So let me conclude. Low interest rate induced by monetary policy by encourage, by encourage lending, but they also discourage savings. The holding of certain financial assets for certain group agents in the economy. To the extent that those agents make savers, they make production or, invest, uh, or, or real investment, uh, investment decision, that could have a negative, uh, a negative uh, effect uh, on, the, uh, on the economy. Obviously, here I structure the model, ignoring <laughs> the typical channel. So again, I repeat what I said at the beginning. The goal here is not to say that we should look at this and neglect and forget what I said before. But this is also something to take into account, and I believe is uh, um, related to the topic of the, of the conference, which is monetary policy and uh, macroprudential uh, policy or stability. Okay. Thank you very much.